Well, it's David Willey again, curator from the Tank Museum. Again, as you can see, we're not at the Tank Museum, um, but we're trying to make content, and this content is really an answer to one of the, or a number of the questions that uh, came in through our Facebook site or through YouTube. And uh, people have been asking, we've done a little film on uniforms, people were talking about headgear, what do we wear in tanks? And that gives me a little excuse to digress into helmets, which I'll start the ball rolling by entirely admitting that was one of the things that got me interested in military when I was a youngster. I thought helmets were, there was something about them that was, uh, they're, they're very, obviously this overused word, iconic, they're so identifiable, you know, with a nation, with a period. And uh, there was something else as well, which I really like the sculptural shapes of helmets. And I still do, and that's the thing. I still, weirdly, I was digging out some of these things that I've got down here uh, in Dorset and was realizing I'm still buying the odd thing, even if they're only reproduction ones, because I just love the shape of them so much. And now you can buy things like this one behind me, this amazing um, pre-war uh, German, it's a replica of a, German helmet with a lobster tail at the back there and it came all the way free postage from India and I think I got that for under 50 quid um, and it's just again okay it's not a real one it's uh, if you look at it closely you can tell immediately it's only just a sort of copy but yet again it's that idea that shiny metal the shape everything about it just sort of makes you think ooh um, if you're like me you're a bit of a of a you know headgear sort of fan um, and the other thing that, again, I'll have to admit to as well, which, which frustrates me slightly, is over the years I used to buy lots and lots of tin helmets because they were cheap or I found this or a shell here or something there. Then when I moved down to Dorset, uh, one of my big problems was where did you put all this stuff? And it was just a bit of an irony because about a week ago, because of the lockdown, I got an email from one of my mates, like so many of you, I imagine doing at home. You're clearing out the garage, you're doing a bit of redecorating, clear out the loft, etc. And my mate emailed me and said, uh, it means it's probably he's going to discover one of these kit bags full of my tin helmets. Because when I had to move down here, I just hadn't really got enough room, still don't. And... I was secreting kit bags full of tin helmets around some of my mates where their wives were out. So they put them up in the attic for me and kept them out of the way. Um, I've got a lot still back in where my hometown, back in Eastbourne in kind of like, you know, in my own previous or my sister's place attic. And uh, it's really frustrating for me because I want to talk about things that I know I've got an example and things that way, but I just don't have them all there. So. Uh, as I've said before, bear with us, bear with me. Um, I've got some notes here because there's one or two fascinating little names and facts I wanted to give you. Um, but let's go through helmets, headgear, and we'll move on to the tank bit. But uh, it goes without saying, helmets have been around since Roman, Hittite, Greeks. Um, you know, that, that idea of you need to protect your head, it was identified very early for a soldier that your head is a vulnerable area, it's so important to you. Um, that's the place that's going to get protection, one of the first places you protect. And also very early as well, one of the first things that comes out is, yes, you need to protect your head, but a helmet also gives the opportunity of identification. So again, the style of the helmet is so important. It's identifying who you're fighting for or with or whether it's an enemy coming towards you. And that's another important thing throughout the history. And um, that idea as well that I've touched on with uniform before, which is also things have to look right for the soldier. So sometimes certain bits of helmets have been designed or proposed and they've gone down very badly, even though they might be in a practical sense they work, they've gone bound, down badly with the user because they don't feel comfortable wearing them. And that's another thing that's quite an important thing um, to bear in mind as we go through the history of uh, different types of, of helmets. Um, so obviously we all love looking at those pictures. I've got a couple of reproductions around the place. Where are we? Here's a medieval Salet reproduction one. I could never afford the real thing, a pig face bassinet on this side. That idea of the medieval knight in armour, armour starts dying out with the introduction of firearms um, because they can't be proof against uh, shot and from that side of things you start seeing less and less people, mainly in the 17th century, that idea of armour dying out apart from in one or two areas traditionally the cavalry 
keeps on with its armour and quite often with its metallic headdress because when we've got armour there, they are fighting quite often with a pike or a sword and they're fighting against other people with similarly armed. So the idea of the cuirass with the breastplate and the helmet there, the French, if you look into Waterloo period, British cavalry at the same time. So uh, armour and helmets do continue uh, in through into the 19th century, but quite often they morph into other types of areas. So uh, again, behind me, just we're behind Finn the dog, uh, on a pike there, there's a British pith helmet, um, one of those lovely period helmets from uh, 1880s, 1890s. The army at home in Britain did something called the, field, uh, the home service helmet, which, which again was tend to be used mainly for parades. Looked very good, looks a fairly bit similar to a pith helmet. And uh, uh, these, these helmets are, are, have a, a role, even if they're not for what we somehow now associate many of these things, ballistic protection. So a pith helmet kept your head cool from the sun, uh, made you as well other things about them. The point on the front makes you put your head back, so again it makes you look smarter. And of course with a lot of helmets, if you add bits of headgear etc, it also adds height. Um, to the individual and again makes that figure look more impressive um, which is another reason why again over time if you look at headgear this way why it grows up in the air as well um, that's another one of those reasons giving a sense of um, you know power impression height um, which which for a soldier of course is quite a good thing to have now by the turn of the, uh, 19th, uh, the 20th century when we're coming towards before the first world war now some countries, France for example, experimented with its artillery, having a close fitting helmet, French cavalry have still got helmets, but most of the nations, apart from Germany at the beginning of the First World War, have now moved on to tending to be wearing things like sloth, uh, soft caps or similar things, um, not having a definite helmet when they go off to fight in 1914. I say the exceptions are the Germans because again, um, really from the 1840s onwards, starting with Prussia, the idea of the uh, Pickelhaub, um, which is a leather construction, this one's repro again, leather construction, spike on the top and the badge of whether it's your country, your regiment, Germany in the 1880s, for example, you know, made up before it becomes a unified country, lots of the different countries. So if you're a Prussian, if you're a Bavarian, you have a different badge on the front. And these, again, are emulated by a number of countries around the world. Some countries even still wear them. Some South American countries, Sweden, some of their parade um, uniforms still have a pick in the, uh, in the setup. But um, off when the First World War begins, yes, these go off. They're given a cover, um, quite often with just the uh, regimental number on the front in red. That, that colour is later changed because obviously it stands out too much. Um, and that cover's put over it. But like most nations, quite quickly the Germans realise that the Pickalba doesn't give much in the way of pr protection. And once that trench warfare begins, and people are particularly looking at the issues about head injuries from shell blasts, shrapnel rounds blowing up, the blast coming down, this isn't going to stop much, um, the leather on there. So um, the first country that actually does something about uh, introducing a helmet is actually the French. And uh, a French general, uh, Auguste Adrien, he in uh, late 1914 is talking to a wounded French soldier who survives a hit on the head because he happened to have his food bowl, or the story goes, underneath his keepy, and that helped protect him. So Adrian saw this as a, a simple way of helping to protect the troops. So he gets a little, a very simple dish-shaped helmet made that is to be worn. 700,000 of these are made um, over the winter of 14-15 uh, and issued to the troops. And that goes underneath their keepy, underneath their soft um, headgear that they're wearing over the top. But at the same time, Adrian, the general, is uh, sets up a committee. He gets uh, learned people, uh, doctors um, and designers onto that committee and they come up in 1915 what becomes because it's named after him the Adrian helmet the 1950 model or pattern and uh, I've got a shell of one here um, and this is it um, it's relatively thin 0.75 millimeter thick armor uh, or I say armor it's not really armor it's a, a metal so quite thin that way 
It's made up of a number of parts and one of the problems you'll see in helmet design is when it comes to mass manufacturer, um, you know, getting lots of these, and we're talking World War One, World War Two, millions made, um, you've got to therefore simplify that design. And this one was slightly problematic. Um, this one had 70 steps in its production and it's made up of quite a number of pieces. There's a, a rim around the outside, this bit separate to this bit, that bit um, is one hole that's got to be pressed and that, that's another one of these issues is when you press the metal in a stamp, is it going to keep the same strength? Does it get stretched at certain points? Will it fail? So there's a lot of testing and a lot of these are rejected um, from that side of things. 0.75, well it's got a lining in, 0.75 uh, kilo, which of course is quite light um, for helmets. Um, and um, again, from the point of view of looking quite stylish, the French soldiers liked it. When they start getting issued, the French soldiers actually think that this is an advantage. And the French army, the first there to get, an issued helmet um, out to the field troops. Um, this one, so 1915 pattern it's called. Um, you can tell the French then change it in 1926. You can tell the difference between them because it's a simpler design and there's not that join between the front and back. That's the simplest way of telling it. Normally we'd have the badge of the armour service on the front and this crown, by the way, has some air holes under it, um, which is to therefore help the head breathe. And uh, this one I just remember picking up thinking it would be a good um, flower pot at some point. Um, but yes, again, I've got some real ones back in uh, another, or well, I say real, that's still real, but uh, some more complete ones elsewhere. Now, following that, um, in the British Army, we've got, again, a soft service dress cap um, that's issued to the troops. There is a reluctance initially for the British Army to take on the idea of a tin hat, but there's questions in Parliament, there's actual complaints, there's a campaign began um, to get soldiers equipped with some sort of headgear, and again, as that entrenchment has happened really from late 1914, early 15, the number of head wounds are starting to go up, especially as I mentioned with things like shrapnel shell. So the British Army, first of all, looks at the Adrian helmet, whether or not they'll take that into service, um, but decides that's too complex, it's, a, it's a, a complex piece to manufacture, and it's not that good in terms of its levels of protection. On the whole, they reckon the, the later British helmet and the German helmet has got twice the levels of protection as the Adrian helmet. Um, and so they go out to look for a simple helmet they can build and John L. Brody is the guy whose uh, helmet was patented and that becomes this classic shape. And uh, the truth about the Brody helmet as it was known in the First World War didn't have the rim around the edge at the time so it looked sharper edges than this later World War II version. Um, the Brody helmet is really a shape that goes back to, harking back to some of these other helmets I've got around here, it's backing to a medieval pikesman helmet um, that you'll see helmets just to this shape um, being used by British pikemen at things like Agincourt and uh, uh, in the medieval period. So the shape is not really anything particularly new. But where they were quite good is they're making this now of the Brodie helmet, they make it out of something called manganese steel, Hadfield manganese steel, which is an alloy. Um, they make it thicker than the uh, French Adrian helmet. It's got good protection for where it is on your head that way. And they create a liner um, that's inside with a, with a spacing that helps take the impact. Because if you're talking about what they might describe as blunt trauma, the force of something whacking there, there's no, you don't want that to go straight, not piercing the metal, but the actual force there to go straight through onto someone's skull. So the idea of liners, which is another really important thing on the helmet, how they work, are they too hot, do they keep the head cool, are they, you know, again, is the soldier actually going to wear it because there's no point giving him a helmet that if he gets too hot and he takes it off all the time, it's, it's a complete waste of a piece of equipment. So the helmets are really important as well. And again, with the British ones, um, they do this spacing system so that, again, some of that trauma that's coming in when it is hit by something, um, it will hopefully help cushion. And another one to very early on, the idea of a, any of these helmets, even to the modern day helmets, of stopping a bullet is pretty unlikely. So if something's being fired directly at you, that with this, your helmet is not going to stop a 303 or 762 or whatever bullet. Um, you might be lucky, you might get a glancing blow, it's much more likely to protect you 
um, from things like um, shrapnel, bits of uh, shell fire, bro broken up, uh, high explosives, um, all the muck, everything else that's flying around, that's where it's going to be. Now the British start issuing these. Um, they go out there uh, uh, initially as what they call trench stores. So you don't actually get one individually, like a number of items early on when there's not enough to go around to an individual, um, you hand them over. Every time you take over an area of trenches, this is part of the trench stores, 10 helmets issued, 10 helmets that go for the guys in the front line. But ultimately these are made in vast quantities in Britain. And the good thing about them was this idea that they could be made much simpler. Um, and uh, this is basically um, about two pressings to make one a Brodie helmet and uh, very little in the way, no annealing, uh, which is another one of these hardening processes that some of the other helmets um, have to go through. Um, so it is a, a, a very popular um, addition to the British equipment. Having said that, um, the shape of it is very good in terms of, you can imagine, uh, protecting from things coming from above. It is not as good in terms of levels as protection as the classic 1916 model German helmet. And sadly, I haven't, um, I've got a model 1916 in the tank museum at the moment, I haven't got one here. Um, the German First World War helmet, um, it has a deep neck flare on the back, it has a brim coming out of the front, deep pot shape over the top. And that again is made, the Germans look into this, um, they, they experiment very clearly, you know, they know what they're trying to get out of it. And it's pretty much considered that the German helmet in World War I is, is the one that gives the best level of protection. Um, it's thick, it's heavy, and they even came up with an extra armour plate which could be hung off the front uh, lugs that come out the front of the helmet. Those lugs there have actually got air holes in to, to help the head breathe. Um, but that would go over the front and again if you were doing certain things like sniper duties in the front line where again your head might be exposed, that extra thickness over the front of the helmet may be able to stop a bullet. Um, but again that was another one where they could thicken the armour plate up. So this idea of the helmet, you know, the issue behind the design of it is thought through. Having said that, they are very complex to make the German helmet um, and again They've got uh, seven stampings, four annealings in their process to make a First World War German helmet. And like a lot of these helmets, there's minor modifications in the war and they come out with a, with a different version as the war progresses to try and simplify that. And most of the German First World War helmets, the padding system, the internal three sort of pads that are stuffed either horsehair or something to, to soften um, onto a helmet band that goes round and again with the idea that that's what's resting on your head, your head never rests on the actual metal work. Um, so that's what's going on with the standard helmets in the First World War and you will see, and again this uh, as I was saying about truisms about uniforms in First World War for tank crews, most of the British tank crews um, in a lot of photographs they will still have um, one of the Brodie helmets, this bowler shaped helmet um, issued. And uh, the problem you can see though is if you are a tank crewman, one of the issues is if you're inside a tank and you're trying to look out maybe a small vision port or uh, through a periscope or one of these little periscopes that goes above the commander's cab, when you've got a rim and you're trying to get close to something, this is just going to hit the edge and knock it back. Similarly, you're going to have, and I hope I had worked on somewhere, here we go, if you end up wearing a peaked cap um, or you've got the uh, service dress cap on in the First World War, this is an officer of the Second World War, but again, if you're pushing yourself up, all you're going to do is knock that off the back of your head. Um, so what they're looking at there, that for the very first tank attack, they issue a number of the crews with a leather safety helmet that almost looks like a pick helper in brown leather but without the spike and the brass work on. Um, it looks like it's almost like a modern bicycle helmet, it's got a slight lobster tail to it. Um, when the guys in that first tank attack, so you can see photographs where some of them are actually wearing those helmets, when they got out the tanks there's a couple of instances where they were shot on by their own side um, in the summer of 16 because the British soldiers thought they might be German. So you can imagine quite quickly that leather crash helmet made of three pieces of leather studded together, small little uh, um, suspension system inside, 
it was very unpopular. It, it kind of went quite quickly. Um, so what do you wear? Now, if you look in a number of the photographs, many of the soldiers are bareheaded. You've got that issue of heat. Some of them to decide to wear as some one of these British items that's been around seems forever. Whether you know whether it's an issue one, this is a later version like this, where you wear something on top of your head that might help cushion the blow. And you only have to think of the old knitted bobble hat. That bobble on a bobble hat, by the way, dates back to uh, sailors at sea. And the bobble on the top was put on so that when you were going, you, if you hit your head on low timbers, etc., on a boat as you're being tossed around, that would help cushion it. And you can see how even just a simple woolen cap comforter like this, this is the sort of thing that might help cushion some of those blows. So you'll see these being worn in some of the tank crew photographs. Um, sometimes there, as I mentioned, most of the time they, they seem to be inside the tank wearing nothing. Sometimes as they're getting out of the tank, they're putting on the standard Brodie helmet. Um, some of them are just wearing service dress caps. Um, so again, it's another one of these ones where they don't seem to have come up with something particularly um, unique for the tank crews. But again, if you look at the Germans and uh, sometimes the French, sometimes you'll see the photographs where they're looking like they've taken an aviator's helmet, where some of these ones are a dome shelf helmet with leather ear pieces and a donut of padding and protection all the way around and certainly with the German A7V crews in the First World War there's photographs with them wearing a crash helmet similar to that. Um, the British don't seem to have one. Um, after the First World War in 1923 uh, the British uh, Royal Tank Regiment comes to Tank Corps, uh, sorry the British Tank Corps becomes Royal Tank Corps um, they go for the Black Beret in 1924 and uh, can you believe after all this stuff I've been looking around I can't find one black berry or a berry anywhere at the moment so look at the images Google uh, Royal Tank Corps you'll see in that black berry they're copying um, uh, Hugh Ellis sees the Char Alpines the French regiment wears these big slightly floppier berries they take those on and one of the things they think is a good idea about the berry is inside the confined space of a tank yes it gives you some form of minimal protection in terms of bashing your head keeps you looking smart because um, you know the British Army you've got to be wearing something on top of your head you look, otherwise you're not properly dressed and it also means that if you're wearing earphones they can go over the top quite easily and that's another one of the considerations when you're looking at helmets for tank crew uh, communication systems are going to be quite important as well and also being black it hides as I've mentioned with uniforms why they go for a two-piece black tank suit as well um, it hides a lot of the dirt um, and grease and other smuts you're going to pick up while you're inside uh, pulled down over one ear badge over the left eye um, and that beret ultimately gets emulated by many other armoured units, Royal Armoured Corps, cavalry regiments that become part of the Armoured Corps in 1939. Uh, Berry seems a sensible thing to wear in a lot of the tanks, training, etc. That doesn't mean to say they're not thinking about what's going to be the issue in terms of something to protect the person when he's inside and driving around. And if you look at the footage of those tanks, even on exercise, the way they're being flung around, and this is all pre-health and safety, you look in a 20s or 30s armoured vehicle, lots of angles, lots of things to bash your head on. Very little padding is put in there on the actual vehicle for the to, for crew safety. Um, so in about 36, the British Army comes up with something they call the crash helmet. And there's a couple of patterns of it. It's basically a dome-shaped fibre helmet, which they put a crash pad on the front. First pattern doesn't have earpieces underneath. The second pattern has earpieces where you can fit a radio on. Um, Again, you can see them being used, they're on certain parades, certain training, but it doesn't really look like they took off or they were that popular. Uh, and there's a, certainly one or two photographs, I always remember seeing one that David Fletcher captioned about this poor sergeant standing there being photographed in this crash helmet and some type of jerking they were experimenting with at the time. And uh, you could read on his face what a nana he felt like in this photograph. Um, but. Uh, but that idea that they are thinking about crews, um, what might be a sensible thing for them to wear um, as they're wearing in that confined space. In America in about 1938, um, when the American forces are looking at a helmet, um, just take you back actually with the American ones because it's an interesting part with getting some other good names in. Um, back in 1938, what happens is the Americans realize they need something uh, sensible for the tank crews to wear and uh, 
they've already in the First World War tried to come up with a, a national helmet. When America joined the, uh, the conflict in Europe in 1917, they look at the Adrian helmet. Some, the French do give the American forces some wear Adrian helmets. There's a photograph with Patton wearing one, etc. Um, but actually they end up opting for the British manganese steel helmet and again Britain actually manufactures most of those that are worn by American troops but then manufacturing starts in America. At the same time the Americans are very conscious they want their army to have and this this goes back to my point about you know the the iconic nature of a helmet identifies you as a country they start a program to try and get together a helmet that is american that really represents them and sort of um that that would be something their troops is unique to them can be wearing in battle and they go to um quite interestingly they go to the metropolitan museum of art and they get the curator um of the arms and armor section a chap called bashful dean and he is asked to put together a little committee and they look at amazingly things like pig face bassinet they do a, a a series of helmets where they look at some of the medieval ones and there's one of their experimental helmets that's very similar to this but with a, a front that opens that way um, and they go through a series of helmets. They actually come up with about 16 different designs, one of which they take out to France, Liberty Bell helmet, they call it, and experiment with the troops. But one of the things that comes back, which the Americans remember, is that the soldiers feel uncomfortable because they look a bit odd wearing this new, um, or this proposed Liberty Bell, as it was called, style helmet. And uh, that's something that, that, that sticks with the Americans. Nothing actually comes of their helmet. They, they revisit at certain times in the 20s and 30s, you know, what should we do about coming up with a new helmet? And it's only in the Second World War, um, well, actually, it's 1940, before the war begins, the American military are asking, I think it's the Assistant Secretary of Defence, to sign an order for more of what the Americans call the 1917 Patton helmet. Basically, it's, it's the British helmet with a slightly different liner. Um, can we come up with making more? And he refuses to sign it because he says, no, this is the moment where we really must make the effort to come up with our own version of a helmet. And uh, they go away and again, uh, the American uh, Metropolitan Museum is invited back in. They have a go at making different things. They come up with uh, uh, three actual uh, dummy helmets, TS1, 2 and 3. And the amazing thing is, and I only realise this, when you, uh, the guy in the book on American helmets, he says, if you look at the profile of the front, what they do is they get one of the model 1917 helmets, they weld on an extra deeper part to go around the back. But if you look at it sideways on the lip on the front, they've actually started with a model 1917 helmet and actually just made that dome shape much deeper. And uh, that helmet, they've already in the 30s experimented with two part helmets, one with a liner and the metal part separate that drops over the top. That ends up becoming the American M1 helmet that goes into production and is made in vast quantities um, in the Second World War. And now in 1938, for tankers, they've already been looking at, because they, they've been using sometimes sportswear equipment. Um, and again, if you're American, you may have heard of the Rawlings Company. Um, they were making things like um, American footballers helmets and, and again some of these go to be experimented with the first paratroopers are issued within uh, American football helmets it looked like and uh, with the tankers they start realizing again we need something special for them it's got three things that they consider uh, first one snug fit second point they don't actually want to strap on it they want it to be easily removed and put back on and third thing it's got to have good ventilation and it's the Rawlings company in America that actually files for the patent that becomes the American tanker's helmet. And this isn't one, I hasten to add, this is actually um, like in Europe, many countries ended up doing, uh, after the war or, or even before the end of the war, doing their own kind of versions of an American tanker's helmet, but it's a very similar design. Holes in the top, uh, the American one is actually fibrous with about 10 holes in. It has a spring down, normally down the side, to keep this pressed against the side. No 
actual strap inside to hold it on it would be the pressure of this holding against you and uh, and a fiber top so that again it's, it's got good strength if you bash yourself and the shape and the aim of it as well for later they realize that what they can do is you will get the shell of an m1 helmet if you want that armor protection you drop that over the top in actual fact in world war ii you rarely see the tanker's helmet with with a shell over but you do see american tank crews quite often wearing an m1 the standard american army helmet as well that was the idea being this one's a post-war one by the way which um it's actually got a metal uh skull cap piece still the same sort of american designed ear pieces on it and it was only when i was having a closer look at it um, having got it down blow all the dust off um, that this was evidently being used post-war by greek forces because there's lots of greek writing on the inside probably in the owner or something good luck or whatever um, but i'll have to go to our uh, um, mike our greek um, intern who's now back in greece and ask him if he can uh, translate some of the wording in there um, but that was the American one. They tend to call it M1938 pattern helmet, and that's used by a lot of the American tank crews in the Second World War. Uh, for Britain, um, we have that crash helmet. As the war progresses, they're looking to come up with a better helmet for the tank crews. Medical Research Council is involved. And again, I'll just find the chap's name because I'm always going to say it wrong. Um, he's uh, based down at uh, Bovington and... Uh, what they, they ask is Dr. Solant, S-O-L-A-N-D-T, he's a South African, oh no, he's not, he's a Canadian, and he comes over, he's part of the Medical Research Council, and he at Bovington, they're looking into various things, um, peculiar things like, you know, what's the psychology about when you aim a tank gun, uh, what, 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 why is it some people get first round hits all the time, why do others not, um, what's the best, uh, safety wear inside a tank and as part of it they ask to this medical research group down at Bovington are asked to come up with a tank helmet now there is a danger again you can see how the British military are worrying about if everyone comes out with a new unique type of helmet so what the British military do is they end up insisting that the dome shaped helmet this classic shape oh, there goes one um, this dome shaped helmet is going to be used for paratroopers they're the first to start experimenting with it um, they're going to use it ultimately for dispatch riders and uh, the afe crewman's helmet um, and each one will have a different type of lining but the press structure of the outside is the same so it's a nice deep helmet for afe crewmen the internal is set slightly back so there is a front and a back for it. it's not dead center um, so how you wear it and uh, this particular one's got uh, a canvas and a uh, part of elastic there's about six different types if you want to get into your different models of tank of straps for helmets in world war ii there's another whole area you can go into um, but uh, so this starts getting issues to tank crews from about 1942 and uh, again mixed receptions you get some people some units it's down to the co sometimes it seems to be some units don't think they like them um, one young officer turns up with his helmet on out in normandy and the co immediately says what on earth have you got that on your head for take it off and they all insisted they either had side cats or berets on when they went into action bit of bravado he seemed to think um, other times people you know quite understandably if your head's out the hatch you you quite f feel like anything that's going to Give you a little bit extra protection you know you kind of want so uh, you'll see these being worn see them are hanging on the outside of vehicles this one's got a camouflage net on um, for tank crews you didn't on the whole need a camouflage net because that's only if you're going to actually uh, add things like uh, foliage to uh, break up the outline etc um, but again it's it becomes uh, a, a recognized crewman they issue not just to tank crews of course but lots of other parts of the army the dispatch rider version has a leather insert different lining and uh, leather ear pieces that come around and join under the chin before that dispatch riders were using a kind of pulp helmet that um, had leather straps around it but the top was made just of rag pulp and the idea was it collapsed slightly on impact if you were actually to fall off um, but these ended up being used for the british army as tank helmets not just in world war ii right the way afterwards um, up into the 1970s 
and the design was still being used. You can see uh, naval gunners, for example, on some of the ships in the Falklands campaign, they're wearing that same design. Um, the one I dropped has got a different liner in. Um, and again, this idea, there's these minor variations, Mark II model, etc. lift the dot. The idea being that instead of just the lining being screwed in, there was a little nipple inside that, that the, uh, the liner could uh, adhere to and you lifted the dot as it was called, you pulled this tab and that took the liner out and it meant you could turn over the helmet and use it as a wash basin. Um, they say that was designed as far as, you know, everybody needs something to carry water in sometimes. What you weren't supposed to do and you were never supposed to do it with any of your helmets is ever use it as a cooking pot because that changes the structure of the metal and loses some of its protective uh, abilities there. So what haven't we talked about? Other things that you could wear in a helmet that when you're looking at this sort of period, I've already mentioned lots of photographs in the Second World War, guys wearing cap comforters, keeping the head warm because we've talked about the extremes of temperatures there. Um, sometimes as well, if you see photographs, the famous old balaclava, sometimes knitted, um, sent out from home, balaclava's really important. Again, that name balaclava, military connection, back to the Crimean War, um, but this idea, and again, on the home front, people were knitting these, there's patterns given out, knit these and socks for the troops, and out they go, and if you read all the lovely jokes about, you know, people's memoirs, Spike Milligans, etc., all these wonderful things turning up and who could knit things properly, and uh, where, you know, balaclavas arriving with no eye holes in, but... Um, so, and the Americans as well, similarly, actually, um, they ended up with this type of hood arrangement, um, which you could be wearing again inside to keep your head nice and warm uh, inside, uh, certainly for the winter months. I showed some of their clothing the other day. Um, I'm just seeing if uh, on the labels here, this one's I think a reproduction one. Um, but uh, yeah, so, and the other point about this as well, it's got straps to so you can help keep your um, microphone in your earpiece in place and that again could be worn under the shell or underneath the liner of an M1 helmet as well. So again, other things, this idea of layering your clothing is quite something else worth, worth remembering there. Um, now, with the helmets that, that are being worn, different nations, the Germans, I haven't got one here, famously they wear the beret as well, but underneath there's a little domed crash helmet under those berries, they get phased out in about 1940. Um, there's nothing specifically issued as a crash helmet for tank crews, as uh, Luftwaffe end up with a helmet that's uh, that, that German M35 helmet, which is basically a, 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 an improved version of the model 1916 First World War helmet. Um, 1942 the Germans make that helmet simpler to construct instead of having the crimped edge round they let the edge be flared and there's some subtle changes in their helmets and the Germans before the end of the war again tank crews would, would have these helmets they're not specific for tank crews as a standard helmet you'll see the whole of the German military being issued with um, but there's another design that actually the Germans come out with before the end of World War II. It doesn't go into production, but actually it's a helmet that you see then the East German Army using in the post-war period. And that was again a simplified uh, helmet because as I come back to one of those problems all the time is if the helmet process, if making that helmet for your troops takes too much effort, takes too much time, takes too much cost, you've got to simplify it in wartime. Peacetime, we can go in a different direction, and that's what does happen. You know, 1970s um, experimentation is going on in different countries with different shaped helmets, um, specifically to um, make it more amenable to uh, communications gear. And uh, the Israelis are one of the first countries, the end of the 70s, to put in a composite helmet, a helmet that's not made of metal, but is made up of other materials. And of course, experimentation has been going on in plastics, especially things like Kevlar, Kevlar strands, better than steel. Um, and if it's woven together or put together in the right manner, it's lighter, which is again, so it's not so fatiguing for the soldier to wear. And uh, quite often they can put simpler structures using more modern materials inside as a liner so your head can breathe better. And uh, so the Israelis first, then Americans um, with their Kevlar helmets. Britain, then we take a, a helmet they call the Bone Dome um, for tank crews, which has got internal to the helmet shape, which has got flared ears 
um, it can carry the microphones and it has, um, sorry, the earphones and a microphone on a, on a wand comes down the side. Now those bone tomes were absolutely loathed by the troops because again, back to, they thought they looked a bit of an idiot wearing them. And there's a number of photographs and again, if you get our nice new museum tank museum guidebook we put a photograph in there with a guy with a caption a guy i've forgotten the guy's name who's wearing it and you can just see he looks a complete nana with this thing because it looked like it comes out flared uh, around your ears like some sort of noddy bit um so again back to wasn't popular because of the shape of it um, the british army then came along with um, two versions of this helmet um, one they call air crew the more recent one actually they're um very similar design again it's a plastic it's a, a very strong uh, outer for protection what they call ballistic protection etc inside you can see again there's a cushioned area but there's also cushion at front cushion at back um, so that uh, when you're wearing it and raised pieces for the earpiece and a strap system that comes together. So again, from that side, that's what the modern AFE crewman's helmet looked like in Britain. Um, I was always fascinated. We managed to buy a lot of these, all boxed up, all mint. And uh, it's my, my big, one of my things about the military equipment. I don't believe these have a shelf life. It's not like the, uh, the composition here, anything goes off after time, not like food or certain other bits of military equipment. So why on earth were we able to buy literally hundreds of these for a dirt cheap price? We used to use them as presents and various other things at the tank museum. Um, when I went to the manufacturers of these, um, they thought they'd be offering us a good deal if we, they sold us one of these for something, I think it was just under 300 pounds each. Um, that's how much a modern helmet like this can cost. And, you know, I'm not, not questioning that, but it was why we were able to buy all of these for about 10 or 15 pounds each um, from a, a wholesaler, which just, just, just seemed uh, amazing, you know, why, why military equipment does that sort of thing. Um, so um, that, uh, if you watch modern, look at, look at all, most countries have their own variations on a theme of some sort of modern Kevlar helmet, domed one, um, that's being used to these days. Um, I, I personally, I think um, one of the other issues that we can, uh, you, you know, not overemphasize enough is back to this business about what certain bits of kit look like on the soldiers. Do they feel comfortable? Are they practical? But do they make them look good? Um, which again, for lots of military uniforms, you only have to think of that through history is, you know, that was one of the uh, recruiting tactics um, of the military is make a man looks smart and nowadays a woman looks smart in the outfit and that's going to appeal to them you know so when they they're, they're off to meet the other partner or whatever you know they look the part and that's still true to this day even in very practical environments like a tank so even though they've just got what look like boring old uh, overalls on actually the helmet there's all part of that that adds up so when you look at things like the modern royal tank regiment in their black overalls their white name bands um, a neck scarf around denoting the uh, battalion um, that idea with their black berries on and everything underneath fundamentally um, it's just about practicality overtly though over the top they are uniquely identifying themselves as royal tank regiment and don't I look cool and aren't I part of a bit of an elite? That's the other thing they're really looking at when they're, when they're doing things in that way. So I think, he says, desperately looking around me. I think I've covered most of the things there. I know somebody did ask, these are British Army World War II teardrop shapes. They're actually hinged in the middle. I've replaced elastic about a couple of times. Someone did ask about goggles. I haven't got that many here. You'll see different people wearing different types of goggles at different times really important goggles by the way um, because obviously if you're driving the amount of dust read some of the accounts you know there's north africa where the drivers ended up with so much muck in their eyes that you know they had to have a replacement driver sometimes um, because of the uh, and the concentration that was needed looking out and seeing out that small space so goggles really really important uh, another one that was sometimes uh, i can't here we are um, sometimes what they call sand goggles or anti-gas goggles were used um, these are german ones these little almost like throwaway acetate goggles that are sometimes used there and uh, um, to try and keep muck out the eyes and famously the British had in your uh, gas mask case you'd have a little cardboard sleeve with about six acetate eye shields and it's one of those eye shields that's on Rommel's cap 
um, that he's got over the top there and again simply you can just draw that down they've got an elasticated band to the back of them and it's just again a simple way of trying to keep dust and muck out your eyes because when you're in a vehicle as you're driving along some of them the airflows Churchill's were famous for it draws the all air up Sherman's you go around and the poor guy sitting in the front you can see almost immediately the dust anything like that is sucked up the front and almost straight into his face and into his lap as they're driving along so protecting yourself as you're going along is quite an important thing um, so he says for the second time I think I've talked about pretty much everything I've brought out I probably missed some other bits off but I hope that gives you yet again another bit of an idea of uh, some of the tank um, headgear that, that uh, well I've got available to me to talk about um, just before I do finish off because I'm allowed to do this now I gave up booze for Lent and so I have my bottle opener and I'm going to treat myself at this particular moment in time um, to a glass or something and I do apologize there a bit of product placement going on Whoop, he says hopefully that will go down in a second um, yeah a bit of product placement we have in the shop which um, fortunately Finn the dog is fast asleep beside me at the moment but if he saw this um, you might like to think of this it's called a tank commander it's actually a, some sort of teddy bear thing um, if Finn sees it in a minute in fact I'll throw it to him so he wakes up but you can buy those from the shop if you're looking for your uh, teddy bear tank commander with his goggles note on the top there after I've been explaining about it there you go Finn you can play with that one um, and uh, also you can buy from the shop as I come back to um, our bottled things like tiger beer etc and this particular one there we go um, which we are still selling from the shop I'm going to raise a glass actually because um, as I mentioned I gave up booze for Lent but here's a glass to all those wonderful people um, who are doing amazing things out there at the moment we're enjoying ourselves we're talking you guys at home think of all those health workers all those other people there that are doing just stunning stuff so here's to you as I have a slurp of the little willy beer um, and uh, good on you Ah, the great taste of Little Willy. I think we're going to have to come up with a slightly different advertising slogan than that one. Cheers to you. We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends. Any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities.